Thanks everyone for joining us for our next Ripple Ventures Tank Talk to discuss how to invest in cloud, data, and cyber for the next decade with Sandeep Badrov, partner at Vertex Ventures. Now, just a brief background on Sandeep. He is a partner at Vertex Ventures where he's been for the last four years. Prior to that, he was a principal at Menlo Ventures for two years. And before that, he was at Cisco where he was on the corporate development side for two years. Prior to that, he had some operating experience at Texas Instruments where he was for five years as a systems engineer. And his investment areas are focused on enterprise infrastructure, software, DevOps automation tools, data infrastructure, distributed systems, machine learning driven applications, and security ops. Well, I'd love to kick things off and uh, get a bit about an understanding of your operator journey, starting at working in systems engineering and research and development roles at global firms like Texas Instruments, and the lessons you learned as it relates to building products as a startup. Absolutely. You know, I started as an engineer at Texas Instruments uh, while I was still in grad school, earning my PhD uh, in double E uh, in Austin, Texas. And so I would do the commute from uh, Austin and Dallas back and forth. Uh, it was kind of fun to experience two cities, one a college town, one like a real city in some ways. You know, when I started at Texas Instruments, it was very much with the view of being an engineer, you know, similar similar to kind of how you got started, right? Like, you know, just sort of working at the, working in, a, in an entry level job, trying to sort of use your your proximal skills to actually do, you know, do a good job. And at the time, I was applying my research in in, in wireless communications to to design systems for 4G LTE. And this is, you know, I'm aging myself. This was in 2000, 2008, 2009, when the standards were being written. Uh, and it was a really exciting time for a young engineer to apply, you know, the latest and greatest of what they had, you know, researched and worked on in grad school to like real world impact. And that has been sort of the one constant I would say in my career like from Texas Instruments to today is to sort of think about hey where are ways in which I can use my knowledge and skills to actually have greater and greater leverage and impact uh, upon things which I think should happen and things which I think should exist basically. Perhaps the biggest lesson learned quite frankly was in my second project at Texas Instruments where you know so we worked on this like LTE LTE advanced uh, wireless uh, stuff for a couple years. Uh, It was very cool I traveled the world uh, you know pushing designs that Texas Instruments wanted into the standards basically you know, such that, uh, you know, every cell phone manufacturer and every base station manufacturer could interoperate. And it was this like very sort of almost UN-like complex, like standards, uh, standards body in which we sort of work to push our products. You know, I learned a lot about forming factions and, you know, politicking when necessary and the importance of like getting people over to your side uh, to actually get something done. I wouldn't be um, lying if I told you that I I find those personal skills like very handy in the boardroom or actually, you know, getting syndicates together for for deals even now in, in, in my companies. And I think that that's sort of a sales and sort of people, people relationship skill. I think that I was sort of fortunate to have some exposure to early on in my career. The second project that I talked about was actually the, the the real reason I am here talking to you. It started out of an engineering curiosity to build a chip for something called uh, OpenFlow, which was sort of an open networking standard that would effectively seek to, and it is on its way, you know, to to sort of upend the margin structure of, you know, the big telco switching networks, as well as the data center switching networks, businesses, you know, Cisco, Juniper, so on and so forth, by actually effectively building a chip, which is way more complex than what Broadcom provides, but actually has the kind of, and, and so has features similar to, you know, what the sort of a Cisco or like a, or, or a Juniper or an Arista like a data center switch would have, but at sort of a much, a much, much lower sort of price point. And it started, quite frankly, just as an engineering curiosity, applying an interesting uh, sort of set of set of techniques. And then uh, about two years in, we were kind of working together with a team at Stanford who had, you know, from which the this, this other company, Nisira, had just spun out as well. And we were pretty excited about everything that was happening in software-defined networking. And we thought that our project was definitely be something that Texas Instruments would want to fund. And they decided not to, uh, for very, very good reasons of their own, uh, which is that Texas Instruments had decided around that time that they would pivot away from digital chips to analog chips. There's basically the chip business is divided into digital chips and analog chips, each with its unique market uh, market structure, unique margin structure, unique go-to-market motion. The management and board at TI were very prescient in sort of seeing how, how the world was going and they decided to place all their bets on analog and sort of move away from digital. And so as a result of that, you know, even though my chip that we were designing was sort of 
a digital chip, TI was not interested in financing it, even though it was by itself a good business. And so I kind of saw at first hand, you know, how uh, really impactful products can be built within large companies, but, but there's not necessarily the managerial will to actually take it forward to market because just, just because the strategies are different. And that's like, it's absolutely okay to do that basically, right? And I would say that the biggest experience there was actually spending for me as a young engineer to sort of be this sort of, you know, I, I don't think that we call it product manager at the time, but, you know, you would call it, I don't know, project manager or, or, or technical lead. You would effectively go and sort of spend time with key customers. You know, this is sort of the early days of Amazon Web Services, early days of Microsoft, Azure, or you're going to like, you know, HP and whoever else is actually sort of building the next gen data center switches and you're talking to them and you're kind of seeing the cloud happen. Like this is around the time that like, you know, Amazon started renting out their servers to like companies, little startups like Twitter, et cetera. And, and we were like, oh, wow, this is going to be a massive, fantastic market. And so we decided ultimately to spin the project out for Texas Instruments and start a company. Uh, you know, I, I worked on sort of helping to spin the company out for about a year and a half and then, and then took a year off to go to business school because I truly felt that I enjoyed the part of the business of explaining why the chip that we were building was going to be so significant and was going to play such an important role in sort of the larger context of, of sort of the networking industry and of the cloud and therefore of enterprise software writ large. And I fell in love with the part of it, of talking about the business of technology rather than just the technology piece. And I think I was an okay engineer. Uh, I was not an exceptional engineer. I think that I was a much better sort of context framer for like why technology should exist within the context of a market. And I truly enjoyed it. So I went to business school and, uh, you know, the year I was at business school, we were in the process of spinning the company out of Texas Instruments. It's a company called Barefoot Networks, which sold to Intel recently. But uh, I learned a ton through the process of uh, finding customers, understanding value proposition, sales, product management, as well as sort of, you know, the process of spinning a company out and, and the entrepreneurial process of trying to convince investors that what you're doing is worthwhile and building a team and all of that stuff, right? And, you know, uh, even though I didn't sort of stick around in the in the startup very long because, you know, semiconductors and I had already seen the light, which is enterprise infrastructure software and the cloud at the time. That experience was sort of very formative and I still carry it with me. Wow. I mean, it sounds like you got to experience everything from being a fast moving engineer, excited about, you know, getting your hands on some frontier technologies, but also having to deal with, you know, learning about political capital and being a consultant and a strategist and an advisor, and then also just not being able to do anything because there wasn't buy-in from the board level, which doesn't really happen at the startup level. It's usually you move fast, break things, and don't wait for someone to tell you to do it. You had the total gambit of experience at Texas Instruments, which I think is really important and probably really valuable for you today, especially at the early stage, which I'm really excited to, to get into. Before you jumped uh, from you know Texas Instruments into venture, you, you took a two-year job at Cisco Solutions, which is a yeah. darling in Silicon Valley on the corporate development side. And you worked on some exciting deals in the cloud and semiconductor space. Can you tell us about the lessons you learned about investing and acquiring companies? Happy to talk about it. You know, so we joined, I joined Cisco Systems directly out of business school instead of going back to this startup. Uh, and, and, and sort of the reason for it was I had all, like I talked about, I had already sort of seen the light in terms of the, in terms of the cloud and cloud infrastructure. You know, this is back in 2012, 2013 now. And, and I could kind of see how Cisco's core business was rapidly going to transform and have to transform to support cloud infrastructure at the time. And I, I, you know, I, I think that it's better to be lucky than to be good in general. And uh, I chanced upon my boss at the time, who now runs Corp Dev at, at a company called ServiceNow. His name is Phil Kirk uh, at Wharton when I was visiting Wharton uh, during business school. And, and he was like, oh, yeah, you totally understand our business. Why don't you come and come and work at Corp Dev at Cisco? And, you know, if you have $40 billion behind you, everybody takes you seriously uh, and you get to learn enterprise software and how how companies are built in enterprise software and how uh, companies are operated at scale uh, in enterprise software. And I was very fortunate, spent two years there, did about, and when I say did, I mean like led or assisted in about $400 million worth of M&A activity and, and led sort of five 
investments, uh, you know, strategic investments, you know, from Cisco's balance sheet into, in, into startups. But the big lessons that I learned about investing in and acquiring companies, I, I think that the learnings probably were the greatest on the acquiring side of the house, quite frankly, rather than investing primarily because, it, because you know, acquiring is much more operationally driven in the sense that you're doing these like multi-quarter studies of a market or of like, you know, two or three companies in a market, uh, seeing how it dovetails very nicely into Cisco's existing go-to-market uh, and product strategy and trying to see, you know, you know, if one plus one can be equal to four or five, basically. And then you're sort of going in and, you know, paying $2 to kind of buy that company, right? And and that process of, uh, of thinking about enterprise go-to-market, uh, about organizational planning and operational planning at scale in software and all the moving pieces of post of post merger integration and trying to make sure that the company that you have brought in is not smothered by like the big giant but at the same time you know is able to leverage all of the successes that Cisco has in the field as well as in the product organization i don't know i mean it was like high throughput learning and i and i cannot thank enough uh, the team there for like wonderful experience that i had at Cisco and it was it was it was a really tough place to uh, to leave uh, because of because of all the learning there, right? You know, in terms of in terms of investing in companies, um, I think we observed two things, two two big lessons, which I I think I carry I carry with myself even now. I think one is that the best the best companies, you know, own their own destiny. You know, even though Cisco has so much capital and you know we have so much access to like customers and CIO relationships and you know wallet share and so on and so forth, you know we would routinely meet like tremendous founders and they would look at us across the desk and like know very clearly that they could run their business the way they wanted to without necessarily depending on us. And so it it felt like it felt like this David versus Goliath moment where you know I representing Goliath is I'm sitting on sort of one side of the table and there's an extremely calm and confident David, right? Uh, you know, and she's sort of looking at me and saying, yeah, you know, you guys need us as much as we need you. And, you know, and, and it is kind of, you know, having, having been at sort of the early, early part of sort of starting a company, you know, uh, during my time at TI, I could kind of understand how deeply these people felt about the life's work that they're doing at their at their companies and why they have started these companies. And, you know, I, I grew to appreciate the very human aspect of why founders start companies. You know, they feel this, this angst of like not being able to do what they want to do anywhere else. And this is, I mean, it's an act of desperation, you know, entrepreneurship as an act of desperation. And, and then like, you know, once it, it works, it is their life's work and they treated us such. And, you know, it, it, it was, it, I mean, it was, it was probably the best learning of like how high quality entrepreneurs like, you know, act and behave, you know, even after, you know, they have achieved some modest success, but like by our, no means, you know, are concerned about, you know, Cisco or, or IBM or Microsoft or Google or anyone else because they feel very in control of their destiny because they kind of have a design in their mind of like how it's supposed to unfold and they're, they're kind of, you know, walking down that. And so learning negotiating with, with people like that is probably the best thing I learned at Cisco. It must have been important to see a mission and vision alignment with them as well. Of course, of course. But, you know, Everything that I understand about negotiating, uh, I understand it, you know, thanks to my experience at Cisco. So that's one. Two, you know, I understood the difference between building great products and having great go-to-market because you would routinely see companies which had great products but bad go-to-market and vice versa. And three, I think I, I, I think I understand very well, thanks to my time at Cisco, you know, how difficult it is to, to build long sustainable moats in public companies, basically. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I cannot talk about uh, the various public companies that we tried to acquire during my time at Cisco as well to transform the company. You know, I think it is it is just fantastic uh, to see, you know, how well complex large ships are, are run by like experienced management teams. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk in startup land about, oh, you know, big companies are slow moving giants. And the answer is yes, big companies are definitely slow moving giants. But uh, operating a ship at scale is, is kind of nice to see, even when you're investing in, you know, fast moving little uh, pocket boat. Can you give us any examples of companies you missed out on that you can share publicly? Oh, absolutely. Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, we we saw Datadog, <laughs> uh, and uh, wow. and you know I think that we were, and this is I guess a disadvantage of sort of you know 
of, of having sort of a very corporate lens on is that we, we felt that the APM market, which the, uh, you know, which is the market that Datadog and AppDynamics and, and New Relic were in would definitely be a top down market. Right. One that you would, uh, you know, go and sort of sell big at the top, you know, with a very sort of uh, full value proposition. And we kind of underestimated the bottoms up motion that uh, the data dog was taking. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of it's kind of remarkable to think about, you know, having having missed having mixed, missed something like that, you know, in the early days when it was getting started. Right. Uh, we certainly missed um, investing in in Docker at the time, which which, by the way, like we were we were keen to invest in. But uh, the company was on a tear already, you know, in the open source. Then it grew very quickly. You know, I feel like Cisco would have made a great acquirer for the company back then. Uh, we, we certainly floated the idea but uh, you know the company I, I i think that cisco plus docker could have been an, a tremendous story you know in a much better way than where docker is today for instance right uh other deals that we missed out. there were tons of public company deals that, sure, that, sure. that, that i can certainly not talk we'll about. have another podcast just for that topic right exactly right yeah I, i'd love to move to your transition to venture capital uh, and the role yeah. you had at menlo ventures where you joined in 2015 as a principal on uh, focusing on enterprise investments in the areas including cloud infrastructure software you know, what was the biggest challenge for you moving from corporate development over to traditional venture at such a well-established and top-tier firm like Menlo? Yeah, I mean, the biggest difference I, I think I just talked about, which is that I think I think a large corporate comes with their frame of reference and their lens for looking at the world. And I think venture is almost uh, no, no guardrails at all. And so, you know, almost all of a sudden, you're kind of distracted and there's shiny object syndrome. So I think learning to focus was probably the hardest thing for any any sort of young investor in venture and it's only gotten worse today because there's more and more early stage companies coming up each year so figuring out how to focus was probably the biggest challenge that i had to you know with myself quite frankly as sort of sort of a young young principal running around and meeting all these interesting founders and sort of moving from pillar to post trying to figure out like you know which is a great deal i want to do which is not a good deal i want to do you know unlike unlike being at a large strategic like cisco where you're effectively winning deals because you represent, you know, the the network and relationships and uh, and sort of customer access of and the market access of Cisco, you know, doing it in an institutional venture capital firm is 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 somewhat different and you know, it's much more competitive when you're leading deals versus, you know, you're kind of, you know, following deals as we typically did at Cisco. So, I think understanding the game, you know, which is that venture is like basketball where, you know, little teams are formed and you run plays very quickly and you, and you, and you sort of try to win a deal, you know, over and above other people and other, other investors. So sort of, you know, getting to founders quickly, understanding the competitive nature of this business was probably the best thing I learned at Mendo. And, you know, the firm continues to excel in sort of doing that, right? The other, the other big challenge, uh, which is kind of related to, you know, corporate guardrails versus, you know, free for all, is that you know at, at a at a place like Cisco's corp, corporate investments team, you know a team of two or three investors would just focus on one market. And you know if you liked the, if you liked your thesis on the market and you liked a particular company, you kind of invested in that company. You know in a in a larger fund you firm, you have to get the buy-in of all the partners and all of the investors. And so learning how to sort of build your framework and filters for a particular market, training your partners and everybody else in the firm on those filters as well, and sort of bringing them along on this journey, right? And getting them to focus on a particular idea or a particular market was also like a huge and a very important sort of learning step in just organizational management for me. It sounds like you scratched the surface of that at TI trying to get people to see your way. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a lot harder to do it in the span of two or three weeks after you've met a founder and you want to sort of move very quickly and you want to beat other firms and you got to get the partnership along. Right. And, and to be, and to be clear, you know, I think I did, I did, I I probably did like seven out of 10, uh, you know, at, at, at Menlo, I wouldn't say that I did sort of a 10 out of 10 at all, right. At Menlo in, in some cases. And as a result of which, you know, there were many excellent deals where like, you know, I fell in love with it. I built a relationship with a partner, but you know, I was unable to bring the entire partnership along with on the on the right for me, right? And vice versa as well, right? Yeah. Uh, there were enough deals that you know we all saw that, and every venture firm has their sort of anti-portfolio. And and I think that the biggest learning at Menlo, quite frankly, was this basically, which is that there's a process with which to build frameworks uh, and think about markets deeply 
and the sort of spending time, like, you know, meeting all of the companies, you know, within a particular sort of market area, trying to sort of hypothesize by talking to customers and other, uh, you know, operators where value is likely to accrete in, in, in a market and having and sort of building the, you know, what a, what a hedge funder would call edge, right? Which is like a, which is a, a differentiated non-consensus hypothesis about how the market is going to look like such that even when, uh, you know, the revenue traction is low, you know, you can kind of believe that this is going to be a winning company, or if the revenue traction is high, you're willing to pay the highest price because you believe that the outcome is going to be so massive that it is that it is kind of worth paying up for this particular asset, right? So this is kind of like the spearfishing strategy of, of sort of investing is something that I learned at Menlo. And I mean, some of the partners there are like just absolute aces at it. Yeah, I mean, I love that uh, idea of you having to co- not convince, but sort of bring the partners on side to your, you know, belief in a company you only met two weeks ago. You know, we tell our founders, your job is to empower the principals and the associates to become your salespeople for them to sell your vision and idea to the partners of the organization. So work Absolutely. with empower them. It's not like you against them. You're on the same side. Absolutely. As well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, quite frankly, like probably like to, to sort of refine that even further, you know, I think, I think it might be possible for like an early stage company to meet a partner at a firm and sort of try to get them to a term sheet, you know, within two or three weeks. You know, I think for, I think if your point of entry is a principal or an associate, you know, I do recommend like finding those principals or associates that actually actively believe in your market have been studying it for a while and are experts in it because of two reasons. I think one is that, you know, setting that relationship early, like months in advance before your fundraise allows you to actually get the buy-in from like all of the partners in your, at, at the firm. But more importantly, these associates and principals are seeing all your competitors and everybody, you know, behind you and ahead of you in the value chain. Tremendous market data, you know, which you can actually leverage. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd love to talk about one deal while you were at Menlo. You worked on the $20 million Series B lead in Signified, the enterprise-grade fraud technology solution for e-commerce stores. And the company has gone on to raise over $185 million. Can you tell us about your original thesis behind this investment? And what lessons you learned along the way? Absolutely. You know, this is this is an example of uh, of a use case where I met the founder as a principal. I met the founder of Signified four or five months before the fundraise. Uh, you know, it so happened uh, that I was uh, on the board of another company, a storage company, with with one of the investors of Signified. And because I was investing in cybersecurity, I also knew Tim Eads, who's still a friend, uh, you know, who was a Menlo founder in cybersecurity. He started this company called 41st Parameter. And Tim was at the time an advisor to the CEO uh, Raj at, at Signified as well. So both those two gentlemen talked to me about like what a cool business Signified was building. And we had met the company before. We had met the company at the Series A as well, but we didn't quite believe that they would be able to pull off this very audacious thesis of uh, not just preventing fraud by selling software, but also taking the risk on it. Uh, you know, let's suppose that, uh, Matt, let's suppose that you have uh, a watch store, uh, an e-commerce watch store that, that you've started, Ripple watches, right? And, and I go to sort of buy, I don't know, a, a $700 watch from, from the website, right? Or a $1,000 watch from the web- website. Traditionally, you would have a bunch of people on staff, you know, who would kind of do, it would be called sort of the risk management or sort of the payments team within within the Ripple watches to make sure that Sandeep, you know, from San Francisco is A, a legitimate buyer. Two, the credit card is not fraudulent. Three, the place of delivery matches like, you know, Sandeep and so on and so forth, basically before shipping a watch. Because, you know, otherwise you would be forced to talk to Visa or MasterCard or whoever and do a chargeback. And, and the credit card networks hate it when you have excessive chargebacks. And so a bunch of companies, including 41st Parameters, would sell cybersecurity solutions to, to, to sort of retailers to prevent these, this kind of chargeback fraud, which is of the order of tens of billions of dollars each year. Wow. Signify decided not to sell more chargeback cybersecurity software. Instead, they said, trust us, we will take on the risk for you. So we will insure you against chargeback fraud ourselves. And so so they believed their software so much that they were willing to stand behind it. And so rather than just sell enterprise software, they also sold basically peace of mind, yeah. right? And we didn't think it would work as a Series A. By the time, you know, I found out about these two, these two investors uh, that, that Signified was act- had actually pulled it off and they had launched, landed some massive customers. Like they had, 
they were about to land jet.com or they had just landed jet.com and like a few other massive companies. And like the business was growing like a, <laughs> growing like a weed. I knew nothing about the payments industry. Just, just to be, just so that we are extremely clear, I knew nothing about the payments industry. But I fell in love with the, with the idea of a technologist and an entrepreneur who's not just selling a software solution, but is kind of standing behind it, you know, by sort of backstopping it with their own capital. And customers loved that value proposition, obviously. It was a, it was a no-brainer. And so I spent the next two, two months working with my partner, Praveen Vazirani at, at Menlo, who, who knew something about the payments business, who knew a lot about the payments business, to be candid. And, you know, worked together to, to A, scan the market, understand, you know, what incumbents are doing, understand, you know, what private equity owned companies are doing in the same space, you know, try to size the market. And ultimately we went with the fact that they were building this massive data moat of like, you know, good customers versus fraudulent customer accounts. And we loved that. And two, we bet on the fact that it was early days of e-commerce and that the market would only go up from there. You know, since then and through the pandemic, Signified has grown in like leaps and bounds. I think the, you know, the fundraising amount like kind of does not adequately capture how massive a business it is today. And the various directions in which, you know, fraud management and B2B payments are going in terms of claims, et cetera, et cetera, that Signified is uh, on, on track of. You know, candidly, uh, the biggest lesson I learned, I, I suppose that Signified was this, which is that like, you know, I had the luxury of time because I had met the founder early in the journey. I did have to do the analysis for myself and sort of, you know, I, but the good news is that I had the luxury of time of like a few weeks to sort of get the partnership on board. And finally, I learned that, you know, I can catalyze a Series B round if I want to, if I have conviction on a deal rather than waiting for the founder to like, you know, uh, go out and sort of raise, uh, do, a, do a full auction. And I learned how to sell myself and the value of the firm uh, that I was representing to win the founder over. That's incredible. I mean, there's so many lessons in there, you know, build relationships early, even if you're not ready to invest now. Don't be afraid of an industry you know nothing about absolutely nothing about, and then prove to the founder that you did take the time to learn about their industry, show them that you care, and then win them over with how much of a believer you've become when maybe before you were a non-believer. That's, you know, that's a great bunch of lessons, I think, for, for the audience to hear. Uh, I'd love to move on to, you know, your time now at uh, Temesac's back Vertex Ventures. You know, you joined Vertex Ventures as a general partner, uh, focused on the same enterprise investments in infrastructure, software, dev tools, and security, you know, what excited you most about joining the team at Vertex? You know, the, there are two things. I think I love early stage venture. Uh, and part of the reason I like it is because, you know, the process I talked about at Texas Instruments, which is understanding why a piece of technology is valuable in the context of a market and why, you know, it can transform a market and therefore like create a lot of value and sort of grow value itself. Uh, is something that I'm deeply passionate about. And, you know, I, I'm probably more passionate about technology markets, Matt, than, than sort of technology itself. And so, you know, I feel like the best time to intersect with founders is kind of at the time when they've built a product, they've started to demonstrate the value proposition of what they are building currently, you know, with customers. And also sort of look at the roadmap and kind of dream the dream of how big this could be, not just in terms of how many more customers they could get or, you know, how the SaaS metrics could look, but also in terms of what else could you build on top of this base layer that you have business that you have built and like what are other act two, act three, you know, sort of pieces of the business that you could unfold every two years or three years to build like a massive sizable business, right? And sort of getting in at the ground floor and sort of being the founders or, or the founding team's sort of thought partner as they think through that is probably the most intellectually rewarding part of the job for me. And I had met, you know, my partner, Jonathan Heiliger, who was an operator and a company starter and an entrepreneur himself. He and Insecri uh, had started Vertex about two years before I, before I joined them in 2017. And, you know, Insec had been around the valley, started his first company right out of college and, and then went on to start LoudCloud along with Mark and then and others. And, you know, I saw in these two guys uh, kind of founders and early stage operators. And I, 
And I love that they were very mission driven to focus only on B2B software and services and, you know, focus at the earliest stage when the founder is at this cusp of, you know, just having discovered that the product will resonate in the eyes of customers and then trying to scale the business and thinking about interesting ways in which both the product roadmap could be extended to build a massive business as well as scaling sales, you know, marketing, operations, finance, and all of the functional pieces of like building and growing a team, right? I fell in love with the idea and, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a pretty fantastic run. We went on to raise fund two, like I talked about, uh, which we announced in, uh, it was a $150 million fund, which we announced in February of 2019. Uh, and we're about, you know, two years in deploying that fund and it has been a fun ride with these guys. Fantastic. Well, I'd love to talk about how you invest in cloud data and cyber for the next decade. And, you know, everyone knows that the big three cloud giants, AWS, Microsoft, and Google had all launched their cloud businesses in 2010. It was also the year that saw the birth of OpenStack, the leading open source cloud software platform. Since then, almost a trillion dollars has been invested in cloud infrastructure globally. Do you think we are still early in the market adoption of cloud-only solutions for a majority of companies? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of at the early adopter stage still when it comes to massive enterprises adopting the cloud, right? You know, if you look at the growth rate of companies like, uh, you know, of the Amazon Web Services business within 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 AWS or, or the Azure business or even the Google Cloud business, you can just see the tremendous scale at which these companies are operating and growing despite starting at pretty large bases. If you took even all of that and looked at it as a share of the aggregate IT infrastructure high, you know, which is over one and a half, two trillion dollars a year, and then overlay on top of it, the fact that more and more of the world is getting digitized. So, you know, kind of take that one and a half, two trillion dollars to make it sort of three trillion dollars for the globe. You can kind of see the tremendous sort of, you know, headroom to grow that exists within, you know, not just these three giants, but quite frankly, a bunch of startups, right, you know, which are riding the wave of sort of democratized cloud infrastructure that Amazon and Microsoft and Google and, and, and a bunch of other companies outside the US are, are sort of bringing forth to, to businesses and to consumers. So we're, you know, I would say that, you know, we're about 10% of the way there, right? Not perhaps even 10%. So would you, would you relate it to, you know, a platform shift like mobile or even just like web like that? This is a, this is a massive platform shift. And so, you know, if you imagine that we're going from a world where you had these massive behemoths like Cisco and Oracle and IBM built on top of, you know, the client server world, you know, we're kind of seeing the construction of similar behemoths, right? You know, on top of this sort of cloud world and the cloud infrastructure world, right? You know, Snowflake, uh, you know, filed their S1 and, you know, everybody around me here in New York is, uh, has their noses deep in, in the Snowflake S1 and wondering how to play it on the public market, right? That's just but one example of like massively scaled infrastructure software businesses that are that are just getting started in the world of the cloud. Well, let's talk about that exciting part that's being built around the cloud, that ecosystem. So cloud computers have become the new normal due to the fact that they can take something that was built someplace and now run anywhere. And containers have also spawned microservices, DevOps, hybrid multi-cloud scenarios and the application modernization and migration. What areas of microservices are you most excited about that you have yet to invest in? So why don't I tell you a little bit about what it is about the cloud infrastructure world that I'm excited about, right? I think I think it's two things. Uh, I think one is sort of the shift from sort of top-down development patterns to sort of the agile development pattern. And so, you know, if you think about client service software, you know, where Let's suppose I was a, I'm SAP and I have this uh, CRM system software that I want to sell you, Matt Cohen. I would have to make sure that it worked very well on a particular kind of server that is manufactured by HP or IBM or Oracle or whoever, or SAP perhaps, and then ship it to you in a box, right? And so that was a very, you know, I would probably make a revision of the software once a year or, or twice a year, a large revision of the software. And so it was this very, you know, long sales cycle, very sort of, architected view of like how software is created, right? The cloud has changed that completely, right? We, we do agile development today where, you know, there are developers who are pushing code into massive systems like Facebook and Twitter and, and Amazon cloud services, you know, multiple times 
a day, right? And so this shift to agile has changed completely how teams and engineering teams and relate to each other and how they behave with each other. And for me, the most exciting part of investing in technology, especially enterprise infrastructure technology, is not necessarily just about the tech, but about how teams and organizations change how they behave, you know, as a result of it. And the beauty of like containers and microservices is that developers now don't need to wait for IT operations, you know, for months at a time to sort of deploy their software. They can do it right now and sort of gain instant gratification of whether they're doing the right thing or not. But more importantly now, marketers who sit behind them or people in growth or people in sales can also test it very, very rapidly and agile. Right. And kind of we're moving into this like amazing decentralized agile world as a result of microservices. Right. And so there are ways there are obviously massive markets that we're very excited about in microservices. So I think one, you know, we're really excited about the market for for service catalogs, which is sort of this esoteric word for sort of a class of software that helps engineering teams, which are completely like, you know, little two pizza teams in engineering and operations, you know, coordinate with each other to say that, you know, Sandeep's microservice continues to work well with Matt's microservice, whether Matt and Sandeep are in the same organization or in different organizations, right? And so, so coordination between teams, especially as you go from 20 services to 100 services to 2,000 services is a very challenging and interesting problem. And we're very excited about it. Continue to be extremely excited about, uh, you know, data and data infrastructure in the context of microservices, right? Like with the shift to the cloud and serverless and all those things, you know, front-end developers all of a sudden are extremely like empowered, right? Like you're seeing the Jamstack come up and you see, you know, all of these interesting uh, frameworks like React and Angular emerge to the fore. You know, what that means is that backend teams have to be able to re-engineer their engineering processes and systems to be able to like offer this to front-end teams. And so, you know, there's a bunch of interesting work that is happening around, you know, companies like Netlify, for instance, or our portfolio company called Hasura, you know, which is building a GraphQL backend, you know, to sort of empower the microservices revolution. Uh, you know, other areas that we continue to be very excited about is of obviously security in the context context of microservices, right? What does it mean to be able to reuse a third-party service? You know, how do you verify that it is secure? How do you patch it? How do you make sure that you're using good, safe code and clean code and you're not like introducing vulnerabilities as a result? All of these are massively exciting areas for us in microservices. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that are just being spawned from this, you know, shift to the cloud that we're now starting to see startups tackle. You know, one, you just said at the feedback loop from, you know, front end devs to back end devs and, you know, the IT DevOps group is just way faster now. Deployments are faster. You see a bug, you can fix it, deploy same day. Absolutely. Day. And you can test in the field, right? We have right. a portfolio company launched darkly, you know, which effectively helps you dark launch, which, which basically means to segregate your, your users or customers and sort of roll out features to only a small set of them and sort of test whether it actually works and see whether it's actually accretive to your business, right? So this is sort of agile taking it to its extreme, not just to developers, but to product managers and sort of growth people within, within these software development teams, right? Yeah. And I think that is like tremendously exciting and it couldn't have happened, you know, without microservices and sort of the, the, the cloud. Yeah, the feedback loop just gets sped up across the organization. You know, there is a lot of people in the C-suite who probably didn't even know what happened in the DevOps world. And now they're benefiting from it tremendously because the data that they're gathering, the KPIs that they can now hold themselves to is actually generated in real time, which is- Absolutely, exciting. absolutely. You know, I have, I have a thesis that in five or 10 years, every department within a modern organization is gonna become agile. So it's not just developers are gonna be agile. I think marketers have become agile thanks to tools like Lance Launch Darkly and Optimizely and so on and so forth. You know, we're gonna see sales teams act in a much more agile manner very soon. And as already happening thanks to Gong and others. But I feel like it's going to happen in the CFO's office. I feel like it's going to happen, you know, in supply chain, you know, and so there are all of these places where I think sort of just in time, instant understanding of data and insights is going to happen. And we're still sort of pretty much in the early days of it, because as organizations become API first businesses, they will then be able to transact data with each other, right? Like one of my portfolio companies builds software for insurance brokers. It is marvelous to see these giant insurance carriers who you would think of as old fashioned businesses, like, you know, adding APIs to each aspect of their core offering. And now, un like, you know, unleashing the opportunity for broker software and for third party data providers, et cetera, to be agile and sort of share data with, with the underwriters. And, 
And that is going to completely change the game in sort of how insurance is distributed for it. Yeah, well, continuing on that same vein with the insurance companies, you know, moving to the cloud, we're seeing more highly regulated industries like banking, healthcare, and government move to the cloud due to the emergence of cloud governance and stronger cloud security frameworks. What are some of the trends you are seeing in cyber and cloud governance that could see explosive growth in the next decade? I think two things. I think just say, you know, one is that we talked about how every department is becoming agile. You know, so far, application security, the CISOs team was not necessarily an agile team in the organization. You know, if you speak to sort of senior developers at, uh, at, at sort of the global 2000, you know, they will oftentimes, you know, after perhaps a few beers, uh, describe the CISO as the department of no right you know for for good reason because the security team has this massive burden on them to make sure that you know confidential customer data or company data is not leaked out to the world you know the, the like fraudsters are not operating on and taking advantage of the company or its customers but with the move to agile one of the biggest things that we're seeing is that the kind of governance tools that were built for security teams in the past either it is sort of application security uh, and application security and governance, or it is sort of cloud configurations, or or it is network security. All of these are kind of moving downstream, you know, towards developers, right? And it's happening in two ways. You know, this sort of DevSecOps, which is this sort of uh, which is a portmanteau word, but it effectively means that this that the security teams are getting out of the way of development teams but empowering development teams with sort of better security frameworks. And so we are starting to see that. And there's a whole bunch of very early stage companies who are working on interesting ways of like making sure that development teams, you know, don't have to understand security policies themselves, but the central security team can sort of create policies and sort of push it downstream to sort of dev teams so that they can agilely move forward and get out of the way, right? Two, the other big trend we are seeing for sure is that everything that, that used to exist in you know, in the on-prem world, you know, whether it is network security or endpoint security, all of that is moving to the cloud as well. And so we are seeing a whole host of companies, you know, we've got a portfolio company called Vaultix that is kind of rebuilding what it means to be a network security firewall, you know, in the cloud and sort of cloud first, right? We, we think that that's a massive trend and we're sort of only in the early innings of it. You know, other trends that we're seeing is open source. You know, we used to think that open source is something that, you know, security teams would not embrace, but as more and more, you know, developers have crept into the security teams, you know, they are trying out open source frameworks themselves. And you see massive companies like Cordite, et cetera, get started, you know, who are effectively bringing the security world to open source and to developers as well. That's really interesting. I mean, there's probably so much in terms of just different languages there being spoken by all the departments that, you know, Agile can really help with. And also the company you mentioned is also bringing the two groups together so they don't have to have this like broken telephone all the time when trying to move very fast. So I'd love to ask, you know, we've discussed, you know, everyone moving to the public cloud. Are you seeing more early stage startups having success getting traditionally larger enterprises go onto the cloud? and stop requesting these on-prem deployments? And if so, what industries are you seeing the first to move and why do you think that is? So let me let me answer that. Let me answer that sort of in two ways. I think early stage companies who decide that they want to be cloud first and embrace agile as they should, should qualify, qualify, qualify customers and absolutely not sign up for on-prem uh, software. Like, uh, I mean, I hold this very fundamentally and very dearly as a belief today because there's almost no company in the world today that does not have a cloud strategy. And so, you know, if you're talking to, you know, X bank, right? I think it just means that you need to find the right team with an X bank, right? Which will, which will use you uh, in the cloud first. And by the way, if they don't want to use you in the cloud today, that's totally okay to sort of tell them that, hey, you know, we think you guys are going to the cloud. We want to build our company on the cloud. So why don't we do this? Why don't we stay friends and intercept, you know, a year later or, or sort of two years later and then go find other customers who might be cloud first. I think the the, the lesson uh, you're saying at startups is it's okay to say no. And at the early stage, it's really important to find the right partners who will grow with you, not just for the next six to 12 months. Because we've seen it a couple of times in our portfolio, you sign a big contract with a really big, slow moving giant. And then all of a sudden they put the brakes on you as well. 
and then you're both stuck in the mud. So that's exactly right. And you know, you're kind of you kind of end up building features and building roadmap that is perhaps not the most forward looking, you know, that just slows your entire go to market, you know, in the future because you have just now built a product that works very well for slow moving giants rather than fast early adopters. And there's almost no industry in the world today, you know, which does not have an active public cloud presence and an active public cloud strategy, right? We used to think that insurance companies and the banks would be the last to adopt, but you know, they all have significant cloud spend today. And there's no reason why you cannot actually find the right teams within those organizations to to sort of be your pilot customer. No, that's a great point. So at Vertex, you know, I'd love to talk about what you guys focus on. You focus on seed stage and early stage. You know, given that you're looking at companies at the early stage that probably don't have a lot of customers or sales for you to gauge against, how do you weigh the lower traction against the larger potential market opportunity at the early stage for investment? You know, for us, it's not really about traction, right? Uh, you know, when you invest at the seed, you're effectively investing in kind of three things. You're investing in, in the market. Like, do you believe the market and do you have a point of view or a thesis that this is a market where an early stage company with a certain kind of characteristic will be able to win and, and sort of make it big? Two, you're investing in teams fundamentally. Right. Like, you know, as much as you and I can sit here and talk about our love of a particular market or a thesis in a particular market, quite frankly, product market fit, finding that, finding that and then growing the business and sort of building it into a giant is effectively is solely the CEO and the management teams preserve. Right. And so, uh, you know, for us, finding founders and, and, and management teams that have a very clear vision of how the future should look like, right? I talked about it, you know, when I talked about about, about my experience at Cisco, who have a sort of clear true north in their minds about, you know, how the market should be and how their company is going to impact the market, right? Finding that I think is, is probably the most important thing. So I would say that the two most important things we look for are quite frankly are sort of, do we love the market? Do we have I believe that this, can, that this market is right for change? And two, we effectively just back teams, right? Like, you know, the biggest learning for us as a firm and for me as an individual investor has been to identify founder characteristics. And I'm sure you do this much better than, than, than we do, uh, Matt, because you invest a little ahead of, uh, of when we do. But quite frankly, just, just finding these people who are able to, you know, get the world to bend to their will is probably, you know, the two things that, that we look for. And at our stage, you know, there are sort of two or three characteristics that we that we pick up on, you know, when evaluating founders. One is, can they convince customers or users to try their product, you know, even while the product is not fully baked in and fully built, you know, which means that they have this sort of conception of why their product or the technology lives within the context of the market, you know, which is, which is something that I care about deeply. And two, are they able to recruit well, right? In today's world, there's more capital than talent, right? And, you know, smart people have the option of going to work at any number of places, right? So founders are able to tell the tell the vision of what they're doing and bring other people along for the journey, you know, are usually the best salespeople. <clears throat> and even if they don't think of themselves as salespeople. Yeah, we right? ask ourselves at Ripple, like, would I want to go work for this founder? Would I want to go work for this person, right? And and to, to be candid with you, for us, like, that's those are the two things that we look for at the seed, you know, there's metrics and there's numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But quite frankly, you know, at the seed, uh, you know, it's all law of small numbers. And so who cares, quite frankly? Yeah. <laughs> And because our investment strategy is such that we invest in only a very few companies each year, but actually spend a lot of time, you know, with those companies, we definitely take the view that, you know, we have to believe that whoever is leading the deal, you know, wants to work for that company. Yeah, that's a huge thing for us too. And we try to do some psychometric testing as well on the founders. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we, we definitely use it. It's a, it's an interesting thing that works for us. So you know, especially in a remote world doing due diligence, uh, you know, when you can't meet face to face, it helps us. So well, I'd love to move to my favorite part of the conversation, which are your book recommendations. And these are some Absolutely. very, very unique and exciting books. So why don't you tell the audience about why they should be listening or reading these books? So the four books here, uh, uh, the, the first one is called 2666. Um, it's by a Mexican novelist called Roberto Bolaño. And it's a it's sort of an ensemble piece of, uh, of three related narratives, which are thematically related to each other, but, but are not 
exactly sort of, and have sort of one or two overlapping characters, but they're not sort of exactly uh, the same narrative. It sort of it captures uh, you know a pretty a pretty testy time in in sort of Mexican society around the time when you know there were a lot of there was a lot of drug war and and violence in Mexico in the northern border at the same time, sort of you know observing how sort of traditional me- sort of Mexican society was changing. I mean, I I was referred to it by a friend who uh, was born in Mexico City and moved to this moved to the states, uh, and he told me that it was it was this nice way of sort of understanding you know uh, you know where she came from, and uh, and I I felt that that was uh, like reading a novel is such a great way of being able to do that. The second book is a book called uh, On Beauty by Zadie Smith. It, you know, it, uh, it it's, it's it's about a mixed race family growing up uh, in England uh, in the late 90s, uh, uh, sorry, late 80s, early 90s. And it captures uh, sort of the immigrants experience uh, in, a, in, a, in a foreign country very well. And so it's kind of very personal for me. The third book is probably my favorite book of the lot. Uh, it's a book called uh, The Three-Body Problem, and it's part one of a trilogy. It's a science fiction novel written by a Chinese author called Season Du. And I picked it up from, I think, Bill Gates's podcast or Barack Obama's, I can't remember. It has been the most profoundly changing books that I have read in the past two or three years in terms of just thinking about human action and and time and scale and the universe. I mean, you know, I, I highly recommend it. I mean, if you if you go on if you go on Twitter or Reddit and sort of type three body problem, you'll just see like entire cults of people that like you know worship and dissect and anal- uh, analyze uh, analyze this book. And it is effectively about about the things we choose to do and the things we don't choose to do as humans and uh, their intended and unintended consequences as they ripple across millennia. And so it's this is this book written with sort of grand, massive scale. And the final book is a book called Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. It's a it's a it's a love story. Uh, it's probably the ideal pandemic reading in my view. <laughs> Well, I'm definitely going to add a couple of those to my Audible uh, list to get over the uh, the next few months of 2020. Before we wrap things up, I always love to ask our guests for any final words of inspiration for our audience. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of talk about venture and about, you know, you know, raising seed capital and sort of, you know, moving quickly and so on and so forth. I think that the the hard thing for I think most entrepreneurs to realize and, and quite frankly most investors to realize that no company is an overnight success. You know, that it takes years and years of toil and grinding to kind of find the thing that works and then even more years of refining the thing that works to actually build a massive company, you know, before it either goes out to the public markets or sort of gets a gets fanta- gets a fantastic acquisition offer. And so I think I think the, the only word of uh, sort of inspiration that I uh, that I guess I would I would have is that you know the grind and the hustle is obviously very important but ultimately you know great teams build great companies and uh you know it's a people business and you know especially in sort of trying times like this when you know startups are thinking about cost and you know you're thinking about like you know how to get the next piece of revenue i think treating people well is probably going to be the the biggest lesson i think learned by the founders that that sort of emerged through this period and i feel like we'll just we'll see like amazing leaders come out like through this through this process of sort of testing their wills and and testing their ability to grow and manage teams and i'm just like fantastically excited for how we will relate with people and how we will grow companies. That's fantastic. It sounds like the pain is worth the gain in your mind. And so absolutely, man. Hustle. Diamonds are created under pressure. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate Sandeep and your words of inspiration. I hope will ripple through a lot of entrepreneurs who are starting companies. Thank you, Matt. It's such a pleasure to be here chatting with you. And thank you for organizing this. And it, this was, this was a great conversation. Thanks a lot, man. 